Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Charles Eckel. This is Chris Ricker. Um, thanks to all of you for, for being here. I thought Chris and I might just be getting together this morning for a cup of coffee or whatever, because no one want to wake up. But uh, the fact you're all here, uh, that's, that's great. We appreciate it. Uh, I think we have some good material to share with you. Um, just to give you an idea of the flow of the way that it's going to go. Initially, we had thought, you know, we might do this as a, like more of a hands-on type thing, but you know, due to the size of the audience and the fact you don't have tables to put laptops on and all that, what we're planning on doing is going through and just showing you everything you need to know about, you know, first an overview of OpenStack and then um, what you would need to get it set up on your laptop and then some demonstrations of once you have that set up, what you can do with it. And uh, Chris is going to go through that. He'll show you all that. Uh, don't worry about capturing everything or trying to keep up on your own laptop at this time, because at the end, we'll share with you some links where it was already mentioned you can go and download the whole presentation. But more than that, we actually have a learning lab that walks you through all this. And so you can do it on, on your own laptop in your own time frame and uh, just go through it step by step. Um, that said, don't worry, we'll be throwing in a lot of extra material than what's covered in the learning lab, so we'll you know, still make good use of your time. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Good morning, everyone. So first of all, show of hands, how many of you are running OpenStack today? All right, so mostly a newbie audience, I guess, um, just a couple of people running it. So as Charles mentioned, what we're going to do today is just talk a little bit about what OpenStack is. Uh, then we'll go through a live demo, assuming the demo gods are, are with us this morning. And um, at the end of it, uh, we'll go over how you can download the same um, uh, virtual machine that we're using for the demo so that you can do this on your laptop. And, Really, on, on your own time, you know, kind of repeat what we're talking about and get comfortable with OpenStack. So first of all, just a little bit about what OpenStack is. OpenStack is a collection of software that's meant to build a cloud computing platform. It's intended either to let you create public clouds or private clouds. So it lets you take all the, the resources in your data center, abstract them out, and manage them behind a common API so that you can provision your storage, your networking, your compute, and manage it all collectively and use it to create a cloud-like environment so that for your developers and your, your administrators, rather than having to manually provision a machine every time you need to deploy a new workload, you can go into your, your cloud management layer and provision it programmatically. And in many cases, this is actually passed through to the end user so that they can self-provision um, through a, a portal. It's developed by a very large uh, community, and in uh, some regards, OpenStack is now the largest open source project in the world, which is pretty impressive given how, uh, how young it is. There are about 24,000 developers registered that are doing work with OpenStack. They represent around 500 companies, and in the, the four and some odd years that it's been going, we've got 20 million lines of code produced, which is Kind of scary, actually, that uh, there's that much code being OpenStack these days. And it is all designed and developed in a collaborative fashion between the various companies and, and developers that um, put it together. We release a, a product every six months. The most recent release is the Kilo release, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. And just to give you a size, a, um, uh, a sense of size for that release, there were 1,500 developers who contributed to Kilo, and that came from 150 different companies. So it really is a, a large effort that's spanning all of the major players in the, the IT industry. So a little bit about what OpenStack looks like. It's a collection of different services that focus on the various aspects that are involved in bringing up a cloud. So you have services like a dashboard that gives your end users a portal in which they can go and see what their cloud looks like. 
You have core services that uh, provide the basic functionality that you need, so things like a compute layer or like a network layer or a storage layer. Underneath all those, you have infrastructure plugins, so those allow your, your core services to talk to the drive, um, to the hardware that underlies them. Essentially, they're similar to drivers in an operating system. So that, for example, when you spin up a VM, if you need a VLAN provisioned on the switch upstream, the drive, the plugin can orchestrate that happening and can talk to, say, the Nexus switch and, and add the VLAN that's needed. And then above that, you have a common set of APIs across all these services so that for your developers, they can access it and they can automate all this. And then you can run your applications on top of all that. There are a wide variety of projects that make up OpenStack. We've listed some of them here. There are actually over 30 today. Uh, the nice thing about these projects is they are mix and match. So you can use just the subsets of them to make sense for your needs. Um, for example, one of the projects that comes out of OpenStack is Swift. How many of you have used Swift? Anyone? OK, a few, few nods out there. So Swift is an object storage platform, and it's actually used even outside of the context of OpenStack. People, if they just need an object store but they don't need a full uh, compute cloud, they might go get that one uh, project and just use it. And that's uh, one of the nice aspects of this modular aspect to, to OpenStack. So let's talk a little bit about some of the use cases for OpenStack. Uh, one of the original use cases was public cloud. So something similar to AWS or those kind of environments. And you all know um, large public clouds that are implemented on OpenStack. Rackspace is uh, one of the big creators of OpenStack and, and they run their cloud on, on OpenStack. HP has a large public cloud and there are lots of other providers out there also. So that's for the use case of I'm a provider, I want to stand up a cloud, I want to offer resources to customers who, you know, pay by the drink and, and come in and consume my cloud to stand up their own business. You're also seeing lots of use of OpenStack in the, the private cloud space. So here, rather than me as a, an enterprise or a university or, or whatever entity I am, taking my workload to a public cloud, I, for various reasons, need to keep it private, right? Either I care about legal restrictions around where my data can sit, or I just have the general concern about the, the uh, privacy of my data if it's in a public cloud. And you're starting to see multiple uses of private cloud. Uh, we have some customers that are doing general purpose private cloud. So they're just standing up a private cloud, turning it over to their developers, saying, bring up your workloads on this. But then you're also seeing customers build large private clouds for very specific applications. Um, for example, uh, Comcast talks a, a lot about their use of OpenStack with their, their cloud DVR, so the DVR that they offer to the customers. That's a cloud they run internally that is tailored specific for that one application of, of DVR to the, to the home. Then you're also seeing some adoption of OpenStack just as a, an overall um, data center management layer. So one of the nice things here is that OpenStack does give you that common API across your storage, your network, your compute. It gives you the ability to orchestrate your bare metal loads, your VM loads, and your container workloads. So you can drive all those programmatically. And the API is just REST interfaces. How many of you have web developers in-house? Really every hand out there should be up. But um, anyone who can program uh, web can program against OpenStack and can automate using this this common API, and so you are seeing that adoption of, of OpenStack also. Then uh, one more use case that I think maybe doesn't get 
thought about much, but you're actually starting to see a lot of adoption of OpenStack as a uh, embedded cloud. So we're starting to see products come out where a key function of the product is that it orchestrates across the data center. Think about products that do like lifecycle management of content, for example. And in those kind of products, they typically have a lot of elasticity to their, their um, hardware requirements. I need a lot of load when I ingest content and then as it flows through, my load goes up and down depending on what I'm doing with the content as I manage it through its life cycle. So we're starting to see applications in those kind of spaces where they actually embed OpenStack within the application. The end user buys the application and it's running OpenStack across um, tens or dozens of nodes out there and the customer may not even know it. Then you also see uh, tailored workload specific applications. We already mentioned Swift, for example, where lots of people deploy just that portion of OpenStack to cover the, the use case that they need. So what are the drivers here? Why are people moving to OpenStack? Why are they moving to cloud generally? Um, several factors. Biggest one, speed. You know, turnaround time, if I have to physically provision hardware, is just too long for my business needs these days. Um, I run an application internally at Cisco that runs across about 50 servers. Uh, if I had to take the, the time to physically acquire 50 servers, get them rack stacked, powered, after I acquired Floorprint to put them on, I'd still not have my application up and running. But instead, I run it in InterCloud, which I'm sure you, you've heard of and have heard presentations around, which is our large um, cloud offering. And so there I can provision in, in seconds rather than in, in months. Similarly, it gives me a lot more flexibility if I run a workload in the cloud, so I can provision, reprovision at the touch of a button rather than physically having to walk the floor and, and re-cable or re-rack. There are also cost factors behind moving to the cloud. At the end of the day, it's not necessarily cheaper for you if you're running private cloud. So you still gotta buy the hardware, right? But it lets you shift where and when and why you're paying for it. Particularly if you're in a larger organization where you do chargeback between um, departments, rather than your department buying lots of OPEX up front for the implementation you need to stand up, then you're talking more of a monthly CapEx just for the actual workload that you use that month is a very common model that you see with private cloud. And then with public cloud, it actually may save you money because then rather than paying for the hardware, you only pay for it as you use it. So a couple of factors there on the cost side that, that may be of benefit to you. Then the final reason, or a, a, another reason that we're seeing adoption is around um, just providing programmatic workflow, so giving me automation. So with that as background, what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about how you can bring this up on your laptop, how you can kick the tires on it and see it for yourselves in action. And what we've prepared for this is a, uh, an OVA file, so a virtual box, uh, virtual machine. We use virtual box just because it, it's freely available so you can all get it um, in the, um, get it on your laptops later. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is install VirtualBox if you don't already have it installed. Uh, download that. Make sure when you install it, VirtualBox, for those of you who haven't used it before, it's just a uh, freely av available virtualization platform that you can run on your laptop. Uh, it does have extension packs. The extension packs are drivers for hardware that can't be shipped in the base product because the base product is open source and some of the drivers uh, can't be, be opened up in the same fashion. So make sure you install the extensions when you install it. And uh, by the way, these, these instructions that we're going through, when you download the 
image that we've put out for this, the instructions will be there again also. So I don't feel like you have to write them all down at, at the moment. Uh, once you have that, you will need to create two network interfaces within uh, VirtualBox that will be used for your, your VMs to attach to and then for you to be able to attach your v or be able to connect to your VMs. Because the end goal of all this is that we're going to build a cloud in your laptop and you'll have multiple VMs running there as multiple tenants and you'll be able to connect to them from your laptop and access them and it'll feel very similar to running OpenStack in your data center or accessing OpenStack as a user in a, a public cloud somewhere. Once you've created the network interfaces, the next thing you'll need to do is actually import the OVA file that we've prepared. This uh, OVA file is about two gigs in size. It's based on CentOS. Um, the class we did Saturday, we used Ubuntu, so uh, no, no favoritism here. We're just. This, uh, this file is specifically prepared for VirtualBox. The question being asked was, could you use this with Fusion? At, uh, VMware Fusion or VMware Workstation is the, the Windows equivalent. And again, here for this class, we did it with, with VirtualBox just because VirtualBox is freely available, whereas the, the VMware product is a, a paid product. But certainly similar things can be done with, with Workstation. So after you import your OVA, you will need to um, attach it to the network interfaces that you created. And at that point, it will be ready to go. You'll just need to boot it up, and when you boot it up, it will come up and it will be running a full OpenStack install. And you can go into that install and you can access it as a user or as an administrator and you can see what the workflow looks like. So let's take a look at that now. So I have a, a couple of web browsers up here. Well, before I show you that, let me show you my, my virtual box so you can see what that'll look like. So when you boot up VirtualBox, it'll come up uh, with a graphical login. This is CentOS. And you can just log in. Or you can log in if you remember the password. There we go. And in my case, I already brought up a, a couple of terminals just because I was testing things beforehand. But, you know, it's just a Linux VM, right? And it's running OpenStack inside that VM. So first way you might access it is through a web interface. Here I'm going to use a web browser on my laptop. So essentially here I'm accessing it remotely. Uh, similarly to how you as a end user or an end administrator of a, a cloud might access it remotely and, and work in it. So here I'll log in and I'm going to bring up two windows and log in twice. Uh, one of these will be as an administrator so you'll see what the administrator view of a cloud would be and then we'll also see what uh, tenants might see in a cloud. So here I'm logged in and I get a portal that just uh, gives me a view of, of everything that's going on in the cloud. This specific login here was as admin. So I'm also going to log in as an end user here. My end user is just named demo. 
So what we've done here is, if you think about um, a multi-user cloud, typically what you would want to do is take all the resources in your cloud and divide them up amongst your user base and maybe put some quotas on them, right? Because if you don't put limits on what people can use, they will always use it all inadvertently, right? So we've got one user created and we've given them uh, some resources. They're allowed to create some instances, some VMs. They're allowed to use so many virtual CPUs, so much memory, and so forth. Right now, they don't actually have any instances running. So the first thing I might do is just come in here and let's launch a VM. So here I'm going to bring up a VM. If you've ever worked with, with AWS or other clouds like that, you know, one of the things you have is the idea of a virtual machine size. How many CPUs does my machine need? How much memory does it need? And that's what this flavor field is selecting here. In this case, I don't need a lot of resources for the VM I'm going to bring up, so I'm just going to stay with, with Tiny. I'm going to tell it I want to boot from an image. And here, the, the image I'm using is a, a tool called Cirrus. Um, it's a, a stripped-down Linux that's specifically meant for doing tests in a, a cloud. The reason we're using it here is it made the OVA a lot smaller if we only have a Cirrus image on it. So you'll have the, this image in your OVA when, when you uh, download it and run through it. So next. Um, because this is Linux, typically you would access the machines via SSH. So I can set it up and select um, an SSH key to automatically inject into the image as it boots up. I can also set security groups on the image. Security groups are essentially firewall rules. So at uh, layer two and layer three in the network, I can re set policies that say this is the kind of traffic that's allowed to go to that VM. Here I'm just going to pick the default uh, group that we've already got uh, pre-configured in here. Next I need to tell it what network to attach to. And in a minute we'll see that you can create other networks, but out of the box this OVA will have a, a private network created for you automatically. Now in the um, probably the most common deployment of OpenStack for, for like a public cloud use case, this is typically what you'll see is that as a tenant you put your machines on private networks that are not routed outside of the cloud and then you selectively put floating IPs from the public network that NAT into your machines as you need to access them. There are other models you can use with OpenStack, but that's the model that kind of makes sense in, in public cloud or in some cases in private cloud, which is really what we're um, simulating here. So with that, we'll launch the VM. And it'll take just a second here to boot up. And while that's booting up, I'm going to switch over to a terminal for just a second. The reason I'm switching over here is I was going to show you we can do the exact same thing from the command line. So the first thing I have to do here is access some credentials. These credentials you'd normally download the very first time you use OpenStack. You can download them from, from the dashboard that I was just in, that GUI. They're just a text file that covers what's my username, what's my password, where is the API endpoint that I'm connecting to. So in this case, I have not actually, oh, I did set them. So I've loaded these credentials into my environment. So now, now I can um,
Now I can tell it to boot a VM here. And it'll go off and do that. And I can use commands here that can show me my status. And I see, oh, I have one up and running. That's the one we built through the, the GUI. And I have another one that is being created right now. So now we can switch back to the, the, the graphical interface for a second. So one of the things to note there is that everything I'm doing in the GUI, you can also do in the command line. Everything this GUI is doing is leveraging the APIs, same thing the command line is doing. So all of this is fully automatable. So I've got uh, one VM up and running here, and we'll go ahead and refresh it and see if the second one's booted up. And now I've got two VMs up and running. These are both um, uh, Linux instances. I'm going to pull up one of them just so you can see a little bit more about what you can see here. In the, you can access a log file that shows you the boot up process. This is useful for troubleshooting, for example. Um, and again, you can pull this up in the command line also. You can also actually log in on the console. Um, so here you, you can connect to the console and directly log in. That's useful if you, uh, you didn't get SSH working right, for example. So let's, uh, let's go back to that instance for a second. Next thing I'm going to do to it is I'm going to uh, put a floating IP on it. And I already have a few floating IPs that are created out there, so I'm just going to use one of those. The idea here is, again, in, in kind of like a public cloud model where you have limited public IP addresses, limited routed IP addresses available, but essentially unlimited uh, private backend IP addresses. Normally, the model in that kind of situation is all your machines are brought up on private networks, and then you selectively NAT into the ones that you need to make publicly available. So that's what we're configuring here. And you see it says, OK, now you've got two IP addresses on this. Uh, one is the 10.0, which is my private network, and then here, I, I'm using 192 as my public network. It is routed between my laptop and my, my virtual environment. So I can actually now bring up a terminal on my laptop. And here, I should be able to ping my machine and I can actually SSH to it. And because I've been playing around for a little bit, um, I had SSH host key conflicts. Oops. Let me just delete all those out of there to, to clean it up. For those of you who aren't familiar with SSH, it uses uh, public key, private key technology to authenticate you as a user, but it also uses it to authenticate host so that you as a user know you're connecting to the host you expect to. And in my case, I had connect, you know, rebuilt a machine on the same IP, and so it was seeing a key conflict there. So what you see here is I'm logged in, and you know it's a very exciting looking terminal prompt there, which is I'm sitting at a Linux prompt on this VM that I spun up in my cloud. And I did it through a floating IP. So I did this like I was coming in from the internet to it, right? Um, and so you might think of a, a, a workflow here. Let's say you're standing up something like, um, well, people don't really blog anymore, but let's say you're standing up like WordPress, right? Um, how does that work? You've got a web server, you've got a database backend, right? So I might spin up two VMs, put my database on one. It only needs to be on the private network. 
spin up a web server that can talk to that database and put a floating IP also talking to that web server. And then that way, from the internet, you can access the web server, you can see my great blog, um, and my database wasn't exposed, and I didn't have to burn an IP address uh, for my database. So let's look at a couple more things here. Um, right now, I am logged in as demo, so I am an end user. This would be the model of I went to a, a public cloud provider and I bought, and this is what I would see. Or it might be in an internal private cloud, IT stood up the cloud and they said, okay, your department gets this portal, you get this many resources, go nuts within the, the confines we've set up for you. So let's look at a admin view for a second. So over here, if you look, you see I'm logged in as admin over here. And what I'm going to do, if I get it on the screen, so I'm going to actually come in and I'm going to create another project. So projects are the, the term in OpenStack for these kind of divisions of customers or tenants or users or whatever you want to call them. So a, a project is the bucket of resources that I'm giving to, um, to a department in this case. And we all have trouble users, right? Those users that seem to just want uh, more than they should. So maybe I'll make a project and call it trouble. Well, we can set a quota on it. So here what I'm doing is I'm saying these are the amount of resources that I will make available to this user. Some of the things I can do is I can say the number of virtual CPUs. In this case, I might uh, crank them down a little bit. I'm only going to give them six. I can say the number of instances. This is the number of VMs they can create. So I might only let them create maybe four VMs. There are lots of other parameters you can set, like uh, how much data they can insert into their VMs as they boot. That's that process by which you, you take a generic image and you customize it at boot time so that it has your information, like your SSH keys or your usernames and passwords. Um, we haven't looked much at storage yet, but you can also set quotas around like the storage snapshots, memory, and security groups, and so forth. So I'll leave the other quotas as they are, and I'll go ahead and create this project. So now I've got this project out there. Now I'm going to make a user that can actually be part of this project. So I'm going to come in here and again make And here I am uh, doing all this through a GUI. In a typical large deployment, you would automate user creation, right? Um, OK, so now I've got this user created also. So let me bring up a, let's see, what was I in Firefox? So let me go over to a different browser. I will now log in as that user. Got to remember what I named them. Okay, and you see now when this user logs in, look at their resource usage. You see they have a different quota than the other user did, and they haven't used any of it. So those VMs that you already see up and running, they don't count against this user. And this user actually has no idea those VMs exist. They can't see them. They can't see any of those resources. We have true tenant isolation here so that you can be multi-user, and this department can't see what that department's doing, can't accidentally break what that department's doing. Um, it, and then there are abilities to share if you need to, uh, but by default we do have isolation here. So first thing I'm going to do, let's go look at the network. Right now we have just this default uh, public network that was created. So first thing I'm going to do is let's create a private network for it.
and I'm going to associate an IP range or a subnet with this network. And we've been using 10 dot space for our private, so I'll stick with that so I don't horribly confuse myself. What I'm saying here is I'm allowing it to use some of the, that IP space I associated uh, as DHCP pools. Okay, so now I made a private network. So now I could go in and I could build VMs and I could attach them to the private network. But they can't actually get anywhere, so the next thing I'm going to need to do is create a router so that the networks can be connected so that selectively I can pass traffic to them. Now that I, I have a router here, we can go in and we can see my router. And what I've done at this point, I have two network segments, I have a router, but they're not actually connected to each other. I still have to physically cable all this up, right? Just like you would have to physically cable it in, in your data center. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to cable up one side first. I'm going to attach the public network to the router. And if we come in here and view the topology, you see, OK, now I've cabled up one side, right? It's plugged into that segment. Now let's see if we can attach the other segment. So I'll say add interface and tell it to attach to the private. And here I'm going to need to put a gateway, and I'm going to use one. And at that point, very exciting network diagram, right? I've got two network segments, a router in between them, but it's all virtual and I all created it myself as an end user. I didn't have to talk to a network admin to make this thing happen. And I can now take advantage of this public segment that was given to me and the public IPs that are on it so I can selectively NAT into my workload and expose it to my customers as I need to. And I can do all this myself. I can do it through this GUI, or I can do it programmatically through the command line. I can script that, or I can directly call the REST APIs if I prefer. So let's launch a couple of VMs in here just to, to take advantage of this while we're in here. And I have not defined key pairs for this user, again, going back to the every tenant's isolated from the others, so this tenant doesn't have the, the SSH keys that were in my other user's environment. That would be a, um, a security risk. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip adding the SSH keys, and we'll just uh, boot a couple of instances without them. Oop, missed a step. So that step I'd missed was selecting an image to boot from. I can upload multiple golden images of different, um, different environments that I want to be able to boot. So I could have like multiple Linux distros. I could have Windows images. Um, anything that will run on top of, in our case, we're using KVM. So any image that you can get to run on KVM, you can run inside OpenStack. And so it, typically in a large cloud, you would see flavors of the common Linux distros, Windows images, and then you'd probably see appliances for some of the, the NFV type applications. For example, you know, if it was a, a large Cisco cloud, you might see like a, a Nexus 1000 uh, V image out there, so you could spin one of those up. Um, all right, so what I've done now, I've got a couple of instances up and running as this user, and they're up and they're active. And I haven't put floating IPs on them, so they're only on this, this private network that I created. 
Next thing I might do is let's switch over to the demo user for just a second. Sorry, I'm starting to get lost in my windows here. Okay, so here we are as the demo user, you can see up here. And if I come in and I look at my overview, you'll see, I see my demo instances, but I don't see that other user. Again, I do have tenant isolation. Now if I come in as the admin user, and I come into the overview, um, and look at my instances, here I can see all of it. So as admin, I have full control, I have visibility. In a private cloud, this would probably be like your IT department. In a public cloud, this would be the public cloud provider. And here I can see both of my users. I can see what they're up to. They can't see each other, though. A um, Couple more things we'll look at here. We've mentioned security a little bit, but we haven't actually looked at that. So let's um, go back to being a user for a second. And let's look at how that works. So you have what are called uh, security groups in OpenStack. Security groups are just collections of essentially policy statements. So these are restrictions at layer two, layer three that define who can access what on your network. Out of the box in this demo, um, in the OVA that you're going to get, uh, there is one security group created, but you can come in here and you can create others. If we stick to uh, an example of like a web server, I might make one that I call uh, web traffic. And in it, I can define rules that specify what can happen and what is, what is web traffic. Well, you see that the services, there are common services predefined here, just like in most firewalls. Or I can do custom rules. In this case, I'll do a custom rule. So web traffic is typically port 80 and port 443, right? And you probably want to allow it from everywhere if you're doing this on the public internet. So. I can add a rule there that is allow port 80, and I might also add one that's allow 443. Here I'm only doing IPv4, but I also have the ability to do IPv6. Um, with the, the Kilo release, we pretty much do have full parity between IPv4 and IPv6 in terms of, of functionality in OpenStack. So what I've done here is I have made a a security rule called web traffic. And I could go to one of my instances, either a new instance that, that I boot up, or an existing instance like this one that's running here. And I can change the security groups on it, just like that. And now I've changed what traffic can pass to that. In this case, now web can pass, SSH can't. So if I put a floating IP on it, I could no longer SSH to it externally. Maybe I want to be really paranoid. I want to put this web server out on the network, but I want to make absolutely sure that no one can even SSH to it, for example. Uh, one more thing I, I'd like to show you, and that is, you've seen me doing a lot of clicking here, right? I've been working in the GUI. You've seen that I can do all this on the command line. But uh, one more thing to look at is there is a, a tool within OpenStack called Heat. Heat is an orchestration engine. And so let's take a look at what Heat will let us do. And I'm going to do this from the command line, but you can actually load the heat files within the GUI also. I think it's just more visible if you do it from the command line. So what I have here are a couple of, of basic heat templates. We'll start with this one. It's just a YAML file for those of you that have worked with YAML. It, it's a, a simple markup language. And what it lets you do is it lets you define properties of instances that you want to bring up. 
In this case, it's a trivial example. It's only going to boot up one machine, but we'll use it to, to start with. So what I can do, first of all, is I can say heat stack list, and I see I don't have any um, heat stacks out there, so I'm going to make one, and I have to give it a name. Now I'll uh, point it to that file. So what I did there is rather than going through all those steps you saw earlier of like build a network, build security rules, um, wire the machine up, boot the machine up, specify properties of it as far as like image, username, password, all that kind of stuff. I have a template where I can predefine all that. And so here if we look, it uh, should be booted up now. And you do see it and notice that once it's booted, it looks like any other VM. I can manage it the same way. If I go into Horizon, it'll show up with my other VMs. If I look here on the command line, it shows up with them. Um, this one was a, a simple one. I'm going to do one that's slightly more complicated here. So I'm, I'm just going to call it bigger example. And what this one will do is it'll bring up uh, two VMs and it will then put floating IPs on them. So a little more complicated. Let's uh, switch back to the GUI while that's booting up. And so you see I have these two more instances that are, are booting up here, server one and server two. These are the ones that are coming from, from that example. And rather than having to go through the, the 20 steps for each one of bringing them up manually, uh, because I have this template, they're, they're brought up and you see, okay, they have floating IPs on them automatically. And if I'm feeling really brave, which, why not? Let's go test uh, one of those floating IPs. And we're connected. I probably did not put the right key in, and I didn't, so... I have to actually log in. But So what you saw there is I used this orchestration to give me a way of uh, predefining what I'm bringing up. It also gives me one other thing, which is everything I brought up with that one template is treated as a common object, what we call a stack in OpenStack. So now I can manage it as a single instance, even though it's really multiple things. So if I come in here under the orchestration tab and then the stacks, you see I have my simple one and then my bigger one. And I can pull them up and I can see this um, topological diagram of what they look like and what all it was creating through the automation. I can look at what actually was built up. Um, and here I did a, a simple example of just booting two machines, putting an IP on them. But I could have, uh, for example, actually gone on and, say, put a database on one, a web server on the other, maybe added a rules engine in between and had kind of your classic three-tier application and brought it all up with one command. And then when I decide I don't like it, I can delete it with one command. So I just deleted that one. Could I see your YAML file uh, really uh, quickly, what that looks like? Okay. So the question was, what does that look like for the YAML to create that? So here you see one uh, that we just used to bring up those two instances. So you just pass some parameters in and then you define here's the two servers and here's how they're wired up. And then you collect some of the configuration data about them. For a, a more complicated example. Here's a WordPress. And the thing you'll see about it that's different 
is look here what we do once we bring an instance up is we then do some configuration on the instance. So in this case, I'm bringing up the database for WordPress. And if you, you know, um, Linux commands, you see here it's installing a database and starting it. Um, so you can do very complex things with heat to automate your environment. That. Uh, uh, would you be able to update the metadata like after building the system? Uh, yes. The question was, can you change the metadata about it after you build it? Um, that's all the, the demo time we're going to have today. But hopefully that gives you a feel for what you can do with this, that you can bring OpenStack up on your laptop and have this very full functional OpenStack deployment where you can come in and you can Take it for a test drive, and you can see everything that it can do, whether as an end user or as an admin. So now I'm going to turn the time over to, to Charles, and he will uh, tell you how to, to get this. Cool. Thank you. OK, well, uh, thanks, Chris. And um, as we mentioned at the beginning, you didn't have to you know, write all this down as we were going along. There are additional resources and places where you can go to download the slides. And uh, this learning lab is, um, will walk you through it, as we mentioned, step by step. It'll talk to you about how to download VirtualBox, install it, get the, the image that, that Chris spun up there, and then you can start playing with your own OpenStack cloud, be your own cloud administrator go through and, and try all the things that, that he just uh, showed you. And the way to go and, and get all that, so we have, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with DevNet, you're here, you've seen that's our developer program. Well, within DevNet, we have a, an entire dev center that's uh, devoted to everything Cisco does with open source. And it talks to you about, uh, if you want to find out everywhere where Cisco's contributing in open source, how we're using open source and our products. Um, we have uh, forums there where you can go get additional information, Q&A type stuff. We have uh, v uh, VMs that you can download specifically for developing for different open source projects, like for Open Daylight, for OpenStack. Um, and then you can find out more about um, events that we have that are related to open source. This one that I mentioned here, the IETF hackathon, for those not familiar with IETF, that's you know, defining all these open standards. And so what we do there is we go and we work on open source implementations of those standards. Uh, specifically for OpenStack, we have this microsite. There's the URL up there. Uh, real easy, developer.cisco.com slash OpenStack. That'll bring you to all of the resources we have about what's going on at Cisco. Um, in regard to OpenStack. And I mentioned earlier the community uh, portal. You can go there and ask questions. So if you say, hey, hey, uh, Chris showed us a bunch of cool stuff. We don't quite remember all of it, or we have some questions about those security groups or floating IPs or um, integrations of OpenStack into Cisco products, you can ask us here, and uh, we'll be sure to help you. Or, or maybe some other people in the audience will, will chime in, too. And with that, uh, did want to leave uh, time for more questions. You guys already asked some good questions, but with the couple minutes we have left, uh, any other questions about anything you saw, about what Chris went over earlier with OpenStack? Um, Regarding the IP addressing for the network segments, is the IP addressing, is that global or is that per, per customer? Is, is there like a global? Um, IP address list and database of what's been assigned? Well, you saw with the, with the admin view, you could go through and see all of your tenants, right? And for each one, you could set up some different address restrictions, ranges, and those can overlap, right? Because they're all completely separate, so uh, separated from each other. On a per tenant basis, you can have overlapping, meaning that I can assign 192.168.10.24 to tenant one and tenant two, and they're completely isolated from each other, so it works, if, if that's what you're asking. 
I guess the floating IPs would be right. one thing where you probably only have a fixed number of those, right, to distribute among everyone. And, and that's in the model we're showing here where you have private and then public and you float publics onto private. The other common model, and particularly in, in private or enterprise space, that you'll see is what is called provider networks, which is where, uh, as a network admin upstream, I just configured a, a trunk and brought it all the way through, and then you directly attach your VMs to it. And that's for the use case of, again, typically like a, a private enterprise where you want to bring up all your VMs and you just want them directly accessible. You don't want the isolation layer of the selective natting that private and float gives you. Any other questions? So, so the ISO that you reference, is that available on one of the websites? Or? Yes, it's on the, the developer net that Charles was walking through. So log in there and you can download this, this OVA and, and play with it. Does OpenStack have Here, one sec. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, does OpenStack have like a list of providers? Like you normally see like the different kinds of images like LAMP stacks and all that kind of stuff. What is that equivalent in OpenStack? So the, the equivalent of like LAMP stacks would probably be like heat templates, that automation of here, take this thing, one click, and you've got this complex software stack deployed, right? And um, there are uh, canned heat templates that are shipped as examples that show various configurations. And then um, as a vendor, if I'm building a complicated application, I might give you with my application a heat template for deploying it. Okay. So, th so there would be kind of like some sort of store. They're calling that yeah. a template. There is an effort at building a actual service catalog store type thing in the OpenStack world. Right. That was uh, launched in Vancouver, I believe, yeah. or announced in Vancouver, yeah. Okay. So it's relatively new. Over. Oh. What, what would be a good uh, resource to download pre-compiled uh, binaries of the OpenStack uh, uh, projects? So OpenStack is shipped with most of the Linux distros these days. So whichever your, your Linux distro of choice is, it's going to have an OpenStack implementation for it. And that's, that's probably your best starting place just because then you don't have the double learning curve of a new Linux distro and it's OpenStack on top of it. So this uh, um, the stack VM that we am going to download, what are the components basically installed? Like so the image that we put out there is CentOS 7, uh, deployed RDO, um, Juno release on top of it. So and it's all open software. It's all freely downloadable. I'm asking like a stack uh, for virtualization platform, we enable KVM and then... It, it's KVM. The, and yeah. then um, Nova for compute and Neutron and what are, like, like complete stack I'm asking. Right, and all the, the pieces are there for that. Um, I don't believe we configured Swift in it, but you could enable Swift in it also. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question and then yeah, we'll ask question. Wrap. Um, is there any uh, support for um, IP multicast? And if there is any, like, what are the limitations? Hmm. So there is support for multicast. That is an area that needs more work. Um, specifically, um, our GMP snooping is limited. We can probably talk more about that later if, if you need more details.